Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. It's that time again, and we're back in the hot seat. Welcome to The Advocate on Plus TV Africa, where we roll up our sleeves and take on topical issues for a better society. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. In other words, we tell it like it is. I'll be taking us down the history lane as I revisit the Kiriji War, the world's longest civil war. Seydou will be joining us remotely today, on the other hand. He shares with us the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. He's asking, has Nigeria done well in preparing for health emergencies? We'll find out soon. Liberos highlights our governance pattern in Nigeria and reminds us that any abandoned project is governance abandoned. And in another light, Evans tells us something interesting about what he calls the Ogogoro cocktail. Huh. That's funny. Last but not the least, though a popular face on TV and social media, but a fresh advocate here, Jumoke is worried about our Nigerian youths who place all their focus on reality TV shows. She's asking, Nigerians, who bewitched you? You can see from our lineup today that we are not averse to rocking the boat in the interest of genuine stability. I'm up first, after the break. Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Martin Luther King once said that we're made by history and I'm going down the memory lane in what I title Revisiting the Kiriji War. The Kiriji Ikitse Parapo War fought by the Yoruba for 16 years is believed to be the world's longest civil war by any ethnic group. It ended 134 years ago on 23rd September 1886. Broadly, Ibadan was a superpower which military successes and wealth led to an expansionist program after the collapse of the Oyo Kingdom. This met with resistance as vassal states groaned under heavy taxation known as Ishakole. It was a fierce battle that ravaged all of the Yoruba nation. Essentially, Ibadan wanted a forcefully united Yoruba nation with a centralized government, while the other Yoruba subgroups wanted a decentralized structure where all the federating units will be autonomous and will be able to plan their political future based on their own heritage. Now, doesn't that mirror the struggle of Nigeria presently? At the 60th independence, many nations within Nigeria are asking for autonomy. The Kiriji War compares favorably with other epic battles anywhere in the world. In modern times, it will compare with the Battle of Normandy in Europe. Recently, War veterans and presidents converged on France to commemorate its 75th anniversary. 
What is interesting about this piece of history is that the theater of the war were warlords like Arelato Shalvi Badon, Balugu Gedingbe of Elisha, and Prince Fabumi of Okemesi fought, still exists today. Same for their war camps, including the site where the peace treaty was signed. Although the treaty site has the Beregu tree, popularly known as Dragon Tree, from the two warring sides, Ibu Latosha is recognizable with another Beregu tree, while Ibu Ogedingbe is recognizable with the Aga Ogedingbe, the chair of Ogedingbe, earned from a rock. Sadly, these sites have not been preserved as they ought to, neither have they been recognized as heritage sites. The cenotaph on which the 12 articles of the treaty were inscribed is weather beaten while the roofs of surrounding structures are falling off from decay. My advocacy is that the Kiriji Ekitsik Parako War can be reenacted for the purpose of history in the mold of Western films such as The Black Panther, Game of Thrones, and the Greek classics like 300. Both Oke Messi, a border town in Ekiti today, where the war started, and in Messile in Oshun State, the battlefield and the site of the peace treaty, signed by 24 kings after a stalemate that necessitated the intervention of the British, should be recognized as national monuments and heritage sites of the Yoruba nation, just as the Oshun Grove in Oshubu. Oshun and Ekiti State should give this theater of war where many people died and peace was made for the Yoruba land, its befitting status and investment as tourist destinations. A people without an appreciation of history risk losing a vital part of them. Our children need to go on proper site visits to know about the bravery and chivalry of their ancestors. They need to know that their forebears were men of valor. And the history of the Kiriji War needs to be retold and revisited. Except it's a white man that is telling the story. It is not. Otherwise, you won't, uh, <laughs> otherwise, otherwise it, won't, um, it won't look like Kiriji War. It might look like, uh, um, uh, what do you call this prison? Uh, Which prison? No, no. Uh, what's this prison um, in Lagos now? Kiriji. Imagine it would, might look like Kiriji War. <laughs> You know, because we 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 don't. Um, I, I think Jumoke said something just before the program that when cameras were made, you know, they didn't have the black man in mind, and and so we have a way of telling our stories. But when it comes to replicating them in movies, is a big thing. And unfortunately, that same story we're already telling it in Nigeria is rewriting itself, and then sadly, um, while we should use these as monuments. These are what we travel abroad to go see. Precisely. I mean, My look at what's going me, on at Atlanta. Jesus Christ was buried according to the Jewish tradition. Yes. Yes. So when you go to these places, these are the sites that you go to visit. Yes. But unfortunately, us had been washed away by, you know, our lack of a sense of belonging. Quite unfortunate. Um, is it a lack of sense of belonging or colonialism where we were forced to pretend like we didn't have a heritage and a culture. Because I know, for instance, that if we had been left to grow, like we were growing before the colonialists came, we were already, um, for instance, we didn't have a Ligua Franca, yeah. but the Yoruba trader found a way to communicate with the Hausa trader. Yeah. You know, to the extent we started having some common you know, words in both languages mm, because, like Lubasa, uh -huh, the rest of Bahala, you the know, rest of so if we had been allowed to grow, you know, the way we were growing without the interruption of colonialism, we would have found a way to tell our own story in our own ways. You know, you know. But, but even at that, even at that, because as at the time we existed, before we were colonized, mm. Uh, the Berlin Conference had already balkanized through a treaty. <laughs> so there's no way we wouldn't have been taken. But <laughs> after decolonization, after decolonization, we should have been able to build for ourselves capacity. Because most of the time, it's either we are blaming the white men, or we are blaming the military, or we are blaming the, the, the current leaders who are not doing the right thing. But I think that from your advocates, I see that even our history, 
okay, like the one you shared now, is as tight as what was showcased to us as the Game of Thrones. But the yeah. problem is that the that, leaders, that, the leaders that we are handed over to us, and not the ones that would want you to replicate those history, or that will work at what you inherited to make it better, because mm. it won't benefit. No, working from the history, working on the history is, is a question of creating art out of the huge Sado. depth of our, our content, yes. historical content. Right. I think, I think, in my own opinion, I think uh, we have a major catastrophe. First thing first, Africa is blessed with very, very rich history. We have a rich history. We have um, cultures that is an is an is envy for the rest of the world. Sadly, our generations, the younger generations, they with the advent of uh, TV, DSTV. All of these things are gradually fizzling away. How many young people today can actually speak their dialects? Hmm. It starts from there, right? And government has not, they've now helped us, or they've helped our situation by removing history from the curriculum in school, you know? So how can you celebrate a history? Imagine what happened with uh, Fela, Af Af the Afro big king. He could have just fizzled out, but it took an American, uh, it took, um, uh, what's his name, to celebrate him. And today, he brought prominence to that individual who would have been celebrated locally. So when us, if we don't celebrate our own culture here, we can't get that kind of prominence out there. We need to recognize that our culture is ours. We need to, to, to uh, package it well in a way that the rest of the world, it will be sellable okay. to the rest of the world. So the work has to be done locally. We need to uh, intensify, um, uh, what do you call it? Education. Right. We need you to know, educate our kids on the, our, the history, all the rich history we have in this country and package it. I right. think there's, we still have a long way to go. What honestly. strikes but me? But that fault is not solely the government, it's us as a people. Even all of us sitting here, how many of our kids can speak our dialect the way it should be spoken? How many of them do we take for the traditional things we do? You know, how many of them have we told our stories, the rich heritage? the rich stories we have. So we're all part and parcel of this problem. Okay, and we Sadie. need to be intentional to ensure that. Okay, Sadie. <laughs> Sadie is going to go on and on. But you see, you know what, Lib, what you said has struck me is that except it, it's a white man bringing it. Yes, and if yes. we're not careful, the yeah. white man will package our history They're already and packaging sell it. They're already it doing that. Our pidgin English that we have, that and we do nothing about us. it. The radio station today has packaged it and for us. Uh, and they're using it as content. And just are, imagine are, the Kiriji Do you know that a woman was right at the center of it? Yes. Someone beheaded somebody else's woman. And that sparked uh, some sort of, you know, civil war. Yeah, and they said, no, this is not going to be, you know. Imagine if that was put in a series, in a movie. Oh my yeah. goodness, like that sort of Game of Thrones. Yes. But when um, we say that it is you and I to do it, is it profitable for us to do? I think so. Because um, we would rather our children learn. Um, Chinese or French, international languages. That will be profitable to them. That will be profitable to them. Ni hao. Ni hao. <laughs> <laughs> Someday we'll come back to this. But well, yeah. a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. Saido is up next after the break. The fact that Nigeria has not experienced any catastrophic pandemic like we recently witnessed with uh, the coronavirus. Doesn't mean that there wouldn't be another one. And I'm speaking on the lessons learned from COVID-19 pandemic. Today, one million people globally have lost their lives to the COVID-19 pandemic. The resulting trauma on families, colleagues, and the wider community cannot be overemphasized in attaining this morbid milestone. In the Nigerian context, was the low mortality, despite predictions from global bodies or hawks, or were we divinely fortunate compared to the numbers from other clients? Some have opined that our genetic makeup or the tropical climate has worked positively for us. Others posited that the predominantly young population in Nigeria or the gap in our socioeconomic group have been favorable factors, or perhaps low testing. 
as we celebrate 60 years of our independence, have we really done well in preparedness for emergencies of any kind? One must wonder, have we fared well in the handling of this pandemic? The response of the public and the private sector components of our society have been varied without apportioning responsibilities on either. Overall, the positive impact can be considered greater. It really comes down to perspective. On the issue of an enduring health emergency management system, credit should be given to the government on the response and the establishment of public health emergency operation centers around the country. However, measures will be put in place to ensure sustainability and upgrade of the centers. COVID-19 has imposed a rethink of the model conjured to tackle it while incorporating lessons learned from the earlier sister emergency, Ebola. We must incorporate long-term policies that will cater for all manners of emergency with clear standing protocols. So in the event of a sudden military attack, for instance, certain protocols must be activated to keep the population protected. Such approach would provide templates that fit several possible outcomes and would avoid the need to resort to an ad hoc committee. My advocacy today is a call to action for both government and the private sector on the need for preparedness. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> preparedness. Um... Uh, you know, not when you treat go you, you, uh, doctors like this in Nigeria. No, not even <laughs> about that. Um, Sedu one, uh, once asked a question mm. when the borders were shut. He, he asked the question, when, why did we shut the borders? Are we doing those things that we've been doing before so that when we reopen the borders, we can say, yes, these are the benefits from shutting down the borders. Mm -hmm. right. The same thing today. Um, the Secretary of the Government of the Federation visited Gwagwalada Hospital and said, he didn't know that, you know, a head facility was this bad. How could mm. he say that? He didn't know the president that. had to travel to London for medical treatment while he was down. The wife recently came back from Dubai. Mm. The question is, pre-COVID and post-COVID, are we doing the same thing? Have we learned The anything? answer is that we are doing the same thing. Yes, there sir. There is basically no difference. Yes. Because the governor of Ocean State, um, a, a staff, you know, died during COVID, and he mentioned that ah, if the air, air play, the airways were open, open. We would have flown him yeah, abroad, abroad, though. You know, <laughs> so meaning that we, we weren't even preparing for anything after COVID. So we've gone back to normal, where everyone yeah. who can afford to fly out will fly out, and the rest of us are left to our feet. And th thank God for the COVID. I, I want to really thank God, especially for allowing the COVID to hit this country. Hmm. Uh, because now we are able to appropriate adequately what our fate would be when our politician will not be able to leave us <laughs> to our fate to suffer the <laughs> pandemic or the, the catastrophe that uh, uh, natural disaster would have wrought in, in this country. So it is time for us to reflect on uh, what exactly we think we are doing that will help us to come out from this. Government should look at health insurance. Government should be able to provide for the people. That's the essence of government. Section 14, sub 2 of the Constitution says the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. But we have not had that. And it's a big problem. To We've us. had insurance, because I remember trying to access um, federal government insurance, um, health insurance. The issue is it would only treat malaria and typhoid. You know, and the, the, common the, the, the average Nigerian has herbs to treat those. <laughs> it's when you have the big sicknesses, the kidney issues. No, but there issues. are nature more, there are companies who are giving that solution. The government should subsidize it. Mm. Okay. For me, um, just I think a day or two ago, I watched and uh, saw that we now have um, technological devices right in front of our legislators at the chambers. So now they cannot claim that they don't know. They can as well Google things right there and, and legislate on our behalf. It is sickening to see the sort of health care we have in Nigeria. Many times off the mic we've said we should actually have a health, an addition specifically for health, the health sector in Nigeria is in shambles. You go to the general hospitals, you ask yourself, is this a, a general hospital? Okay, so aside from where, talking about where, it. where you have sticks, being, uh, uh, what's that thing called? Drips. Yeah. Being, being Hanging stopped. on sticks. 
You see babies, babies being um, newborn babies. Ask, I wanted to add quickly that uh, this advocacy, while it's, you know, we're talking about coro uh, the coronavirus now, tomorrow it could be Cameroon. I mean, we've had situations, Ghana now uh, attacking the embassy. Tomorrow it could be, it could be worse. How prepared are we for emergencies of any kind? Do we have like a 10-year, 5-year plan to put in, uh, protocols in place for these unimagined situations? It's time we begin to have this conversation. Yes, our health is in shambles. What about the other sectors? Mm. What about Boko Haram is still localized in the degree they are growing? Do. You understand? We need to look at our emergency situation. In other clients, they have alarm systems that would, you know, they have safe safe zones where you go, they stock up food, they have, you know, look at what happened now with COVID. Pharmacies have made pharmacists and pharmacies have made a killing. Rather than, you know, help Say the public, oh. they you know increase the fees for all their drugs. You know, they profited all of uh, through this because we didn't have a public government had had backup. At that time, it would have made situations like this, you know, manageable. So we need to begin to have this conversation, not just health. Now, it could be anything, but we must have uh, emergency protocol in place. Once upon a time, we had swift responses to emergency yes. emergencies. But nowadays, we're on our own again. We seem to have this... this ability to just wake up and be all over the place and you know be efficient and then we just go to sleep again I, I wanted to pose and then a question everything goes to, to, to the lawyers no. aside from talking about it as citizens we all know the problems how do we um impose because the the government are supposed to work for the people they're not working for their own pockets how do we make it mandatory that once you become a government or public official you must use our health facilities it, it takes um it takes willpower. We had said that once, including yes. our schools. It Let takes, your children takes, go to our schools. It takes but willpower and leading by examples. One reason a lot of people voted for President Buhari was he said all of these things. True, very mm. true, sir. And so when you come, in respective of, in spite of the position of the law, you say, I want to lead by example. No minister of mine Most should send their abroad. children abroad mm. for, for education. Oh, you now see vice president celebrating graduation of their children. <laughs> Did you schools. see everyone celebrating, so celebrating virtually their, during the lockdown? Today your president going abroad you know? for... You know, and if so, you ask them to, to, to enact it as a law, when you do that, who are the people who are going to enact yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's, there so are it's people the same who them. benefit from traveling them, them. all over the place. So, so we are trapped. It's quite you know, unfortunate, really. Um, well, like we said, it's in, in an event of emergency, if you fail to plan... It's all about humanity, and your humanity can just go under the drain. Mm. After the break, I'll visit our governance pattern. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. One practice prevalent among governors in Nigeria is the abandonment of projects initiated by their predecessor in office, even when to, they belong to the same political party. But you should remember, every abandoned project is abandoned governance. In spite of the achievement of Ambodi as governor in Lagos State, it is a notorious fact that he abandoned most of the project initiated by Governor Fashola, his predecessor in office, and started a completely new set of projects. The Maitu to Kokomaiko Road, the railway from Maitu to Marina, the Lubiri housing scheme just by the foot of Todmelan Bridge in Adeniji. All these are cases that readily come to mind. Governor Sonwolu also seems to be following in the same trajectory by abandoning most projects 
and body initiated, but both share the same platform and the same ideology. Otherwise, how can one explain that since May 2019, when Sanwon Lu was sworn in, he has not continued with the opening up of the waterways transportation already initiated and started by Ambodi's government. With the dredging of the Badagri water channel to Ebuto Yojo, since the former governor had executed the dredging of the Ebuto Yojo to CMS as is of the channel. This is considering the hardship residents and commuters in that area face daily on the death trap called the Okokomaiko to Badagri Road that I talked about last week. Coupled with the snail speed approach of the rehabilitation work on the same road, despite the fact that the Minister of Works, Babatunde Rajifashola, is a former governor of Lagos State. And even the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabi Amila, is also from Lagos. And then the Vice President also was an Attorney General in Lagos. Ambode concluded the survey of the dredging of the river from Badagri to CMS, and had actually dredged same from Ebuti Ojo to CMS, and was to commence the dredging of Badagri to Ojo by 2020. But unfortunately, it's Ambode, so the current government had abandoned the project for reasons best known to them. Why are we so fixated on just road construction in an aquatic state like this in Lagos? That's my question. When government can create alternative means of transportation by dredging most of the water's channels, what would it cost the government to dredge Marina to Oyimbo, for example, or Marina to Ekpe? Considering the fact that the road from Ekpe or Lego, Aja to Ekpe is not occadarable, not even the talk of motorable, according to my friend Adeniji Bosharun. In the current state of the Badagri Road, it takes seven, six to seven hours to travel from Badagri to CMS. It will, however, take just one hour by boat to do the same journey. So why is government only interested in creating that multiple channel of transportation when it will take only about two months to dredge the same channel? I wish I knew the answer. I be you know, you let us know. I will therefore advocate that Lagos State being an aquatic state the government can effectively decongest the road and ease movement if only it will, in, it will invest in inland waterways. Not only is it cheaper, but it's less costly to maintain. It makes carriage of bulky load easier. Also, transport for foreign trades and contributes to decongesting an over, overloaded road network in densely populated regions like Lagos. No matter the misunderstanding between a governor and his predecessor in office, once you share same political belief and party, it is imperative that you continue the good infrastructural work already started by your predecessor in office for the benefit of the state and all. After all, Nahu Commission Project Nine Builder. So what would you want to be remembered for? What would you want to be remembered for? What will our parties, our major political parties, be, want to be remembered for? What, it's none of our business if you have personality clashes within your, within your party. What we want to see is that you have put forth this candidate from your party. We have voted for your party so that this candidate can work. And if this candidate leaves after he's scheduled your term and you put somebody else there, we, we expect that the party should continue all this, it, I think it's, it's, it's so petty and it's so retrogressive for a party to watch as individuals undermine their own bigger picture and vision. And it's about time, 60th anniversary, it's about time we stopped all of this pettiness in governance. No. So we tell in Lagos, and it's, it's the model state in Nigeria, no matter where you want to argue it from. This is what I this think. This should stop. Yeah, this is what I think that uh, the State House of Assembly should address. Mm. because it is now a, an issue in the states and the people are the worst hit. So the lawmakers, the National Assembly, the House of Assembly of Lagos State should come up with a legislation that will ensure continuity of projects. Because when you have a law and a governor uh, violates that law, even though he cannot be taken to court because of immunity, right. he, can, he can be prosecuted after his tenure. But we must have a legislation that will ensure that if a governor has started a good job and then the state has approved of that job, the next governor or the incoming governor should also take on that project and execute it accordingly. Until we do that, we do you know which uh, reminds me? Don't we have opposition at all in, in this state? Not at all. It's 20 oh, no, over 20. We have opposition it's in Lagos State. Lagos State. Lagos State. Lagos State. Lagos State. Lagos in engineering, engineering school, they used to teach us uh, 
that you would apply from first, there's something we call first principle. In other words, you want to go to the root cause. Now, the root cause of this problem is as a people, we don't have a vision, mm. right? And then the process that we use to select our leaders is faulty, right? The, self, uh, the process is centered around, you know, your ethnic. Now we do, um, what do you call it? Uh, rotation. Is it? Uh, yes. Uh, what's it called again? Water system. Water system. It, it, it's from the southwest and then you move to the north and then it mm. goes on. We're not paying emphasis on competence. Mm. What process are we putting in place, right, to choose the right people that will follow? Because aside from having a representative from APC who would be governor, that person has to come and sell to us what policies or what projects, how do you intend to govern the state? Then we'll tell you that you must continue what Ambode or what a social person has done. You can't abandon this project. And that way we can now hold them accountable. But we don't have this process. Nigerians have been excluded from all of this process. So all we do is keep going after individual lapses like this. We need to have a process where we can demand from our leaders. We'll tell them before they get there, this is how we want you to, this is what we expect from you. And we're going to hold you accountable because if you don't do that, after four years, you'd not have another term. So we need to have that process where the most capable person, not because you're from the north or you're from the south, no, competent people should be holding positions and people that align with the vision and aspiration of, our, of the but, country but, but, but or, yeah. or the people of that country. But quickly, so that's uh, where maybe, I think maybe we've before Jumoke, um, you find, for me, how can we be in Lagos and we do not have alternative means of transportation? I mean, Ambode built the Bariga jetty, yeah, commissioned it, but now the Lagos state government had refused to open up Bariga to Marina jetty, so that you know you is now imagine having it's infantile. If you have hmm. if you have big vessels from Bariga, I just drive into the vessel and then mm. I don't have to wait whether they are opening or closing Todd Mill and Bridge. Yes, you yes. know, I just cross you. and I pay mm. and, you know, yeah, so when you do all of these things, I talked about the road from Badagri to um, CMS. CMS. Do you know that it will take you hours. one month to, or two months to dredge that road? That channel. He said, that channel, instead of having to, for 12 years now we've been constructing that road, do you know that you would have years. taken a lot of traffic off the road? Off the road. By channeling that, uh, 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 dredging that channel. Uh, uh, channel, and then create proper uh, uh, um, inland waterway transportation there, mm. and then we say we are poor, we are looking for money. This is alternative way, um, CMS to Ekpe, mm. fantastic route. The road now, as I speak to you, is not a cadarable, not to talk of money. <laughs> <not a cadarable. laughs> right after, after um, what's it called? After Aja, you begin to see how not a cadarable it is. Mm. Two yeah. quick things. We as a people would say that um, the new governor or president hasn't done anything of their own. They're just finishing projects started by their predecessor. I remember us talking about the railway from Kaduna to Abuja and the international airport in Abuja. That the president is just finishing President Jonathan's um, projects. Again, how do you abandon projects? If it is already paid for, someone comes in and makes a project ongoing, how does he stop it? I don't understand. He just they doesn't go there understand. anymore. Like Sedu it starts said, his own. Sedu said um, it's a um, uh, big lack of vision. But well, all we're saying is pointing alternative ways to our government in the best possible way we can. Now, let's hear from you on how you've pointed the way for us. Oh, Lou Yemisi, that speaks on my uh, uh, last week's advocacy. She says, hmm, show me one good road in Lagos, self suffering and smiling has become the slogan of the masses. My dear, now so we see him. Organ okay, Job of Vivian also says, Thank you so very much for this wake up call. Bwari hates the South and prefers Niger Republic. If not, why constructing railway to link another man's country if he's not from there? <laughs> I know Lafo. <laughs> Thank you, Organ okay, Job of Vivian and Oluya Misidada. We appreciate your participation with us on our conversation. Continue to advocate with us on our social media platform on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. And on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, just simply go to plustvafrica.com for slash the advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, Evan speaks on Nigeria and their Ogoguru cocktail. I laugh, I can't wait to hear that. <laughs> five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that 
mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. It is the independent edition of the advocate. Nigeria is 60. But I am not convinced we have made much progress. Perhaps we should adopt this as a season of sober reflection, mend the cracks on the walls of our unity, and recreate Nigeria. This takes me to my premise of the advocate today stealing the children's bread and the Ogogoro cocktail. I sang the national anthem and recited the pledge with great passion as a child. I read the histories of our heroes past and bore the fascination in my mind while absorbing life's reality in my formative years. I looked to a nation that will bestow us with the pursuit of happiness and leadership to a government that will put her people first in the determination of her policy for the common good of all. I joined the Boy Scout to further entrench my enthusiasm, believing in a better country, where the fundamental objectives and directive principles of state policies will be justice for all and the restoration of the dignity of man. Four decades later, I look back and I see those lofty dreams drifting away as the nation struggles to rescue herself from herself. We have become the veterans of creative suffering in the vault of wealth we fall. Today, I looked at the Nigerian child and I am deeply worried about their future. Just this week, the sum of 2.67 billion naira of the social intervention scheme meant for the feeding of children during the lockdown was found in a personal bank account by the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC. Remember, lest we forget, that the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development said her ministry spent 523.3 million to feed school children during the COVID-19 lockdown. She has equally exonerated her ministry from the just discovered 2.67 billion Naira school feeding program fund just uncovered by the ICPC, arguing that hers was different from the news going around. It is pathetic how people steal from children and still keep a straight face. Did you see the woman with your Gogoro story online during the lockdown? Who, out of frustration, took to drinking Ogogoro to stupor as a prophylactic to temporarily assuage the hardship occasioned by the pandemic? Hers was an improvised Ogogoro cocktail meant to get her high and above her problems, admits the poverty. She is a parent to one of those children the government claimed to have failed. I call it the Ogogoro cocktail because while the government was busy playing politics with the National Register for the Social Intervention Scheme, the poor and the needy were helping themselves with dangerous substances to fight and fortify themselves against poverty and the COVID-19 pandemic. This woman depicts the aftermath of a dysfunctional society whose citizens are at the mercy of their own abuse. There is also the story of the woman who went out desperately to solicit for sex 
to enable her to feed her children during the lockdown, when the government claim it has spent billions of naira to feed children. She took that option at the height of desperation and helplessness. The self-soliciting woman symbolizes a level of social disorder and the failure of a society with a zero social support system. I would therefore advocate that the government must investigate, apprehend, and bring to justice all those involved in stealing the children's bread and telling lies against the innocent. I shall go to Rabbi again. There you go. <laughs> you remember back then, during the lockdown, we criticized this particular uh, feeding of children at, from, uh, at home. And one of the things we said was, why do you want to feed children who are already with their parents? Mm -hmm. Children if you didn't feed while they were in school. While they were in school. Oh, now yeah. you want to feed them while they're yeah, with their... With, first of all... But the government said that they had paid... Since they had paid their right. the program, she just and the in. minister of humanitarian affairs at that time came out. She was she was bragging and boasting and saying that yeah, they're going to do. It. First of all, they said they were giving palliative. children palliative. no, not even palliative. That they were giving them raw food. Suddenly, yes. we saw them sitting in a, in a photo. We saw them sitting with jollof rice and these children. Yeah. <laughs> then they said they started the from Abuja yeah. in a classroom. Yeah. So how come they took the children from their parents to the classroom again during lockdown? Hmm. The moment now, that's you share one. palliative to the poor of the poor, you know. Now, you so know, you classify poor in Nigeria. You have to be poor and they're poor. Poor of the poor. Vulnerable. The, the point I'm making, Lib, is that at the end of the day, we uh, learned uh, they did it in Lagos and Abuja. God, what though. about the rest of the, of the country? Now, monies are found in, its private, way accounts. in private accounts. In private accounts. We were no, no, shouting God. ourselves hoarse then. It was as if we hated... People in you government. see, the only thing for me really Here we are. Is, the, is the fact that whatever the Jonathan government did that we criticize, this government has perfected and doubled. Yes, sir. So the unfortunate part, the reverse is that for those that criticized the Jonathan's government, they are now in know, government, are now creating excuses for this sleaze that is happening. And those that created excuses during Jonathan's time are the ones now criticizing, you know, what is happening. And then when you criticize it, people that came to tell you that we'll do it differently, it's very they'll convenient tell to tell well you, as... Jonathan did it the same way. Yeah. And that's, you know, so that is why for me, we forget that we are the ones in opposition. We are the ones that will bear the brunt. Yeah. And they the are minister. united at the top. Just look at the do. Uh, Obaseki moved from APC to PDP. Is there a move from PDP, PDP to, to APC? APC. So just switched camp. Yeah. It's yeah. the same old same. But yeah. the point I'm making again is that the minister can tell us she has nothing to do with it. It's your ministry. True. You must give <laughs> yeah. us that. There's something called accountability. You yes. can't wash your hands off it. No, she's true. A no you person. can't. You must tell us how very, those very monies true. found their ways These are into private government. accounts. Don't, please don't indict people <laughs> who are doing their uh, and at the time when she kept on insisting that they were going to feed children at home, people said, are you going to be feeding them online via, you know, Zoom? It's even an insult <laughs> to the parents. <laughs> it's an insult <laughs> to the parents. Yeah. And you've switched roles. And to the children. Uh, uh, Sedu, Sedu, uh, somebody said your children uh, were fed at home during the lockdown by government. I don't know how true that is. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. That's so cheeky. See, the thinking behind this, the school feeding program, I think it's a laudable project. Now, what, what were they trying to achieve? If, if the only meal you're going to get in school, what it means is it would encourage children to want to go to school. Mm -hmm. However, implementation is where they have gotten it wrong. You understand? I think this incident here needs to be uh, thoroughly investigated and the culprits must be held accountable and punished. Part of the reason that problem we've been having in Nigeria here is that the big men are not, we don't see them being punished. They should make example of people like this. Whoever, whoever is behind this scandal, if it's the minister, the minister should be punished severely. I'm talking jail time because education is very key. Imagine the kids, those kids, some of them, that meal they're going to eat would be the only meal for the day, you know? So it's wickedness at the highest order. True. Now, uh, uh, there, there's 15 to 20% that should be allocated for education for any serious country, how I will, what attention are we putting on education? Mm. You understand? 
we need to rethink this thing. These people that they have a heart, do they do they even mean well for us? Oh yeah. Precisely. So Say I would to... suggest that we get with this the people behind oh, this yeah. this whatever it is the uh, the the fraud must be brought to book. Yeah. So you because remember, it's a national embarrassment and we should not let it go under the carpet. Yes. Remember I made a case for children on this on this program once 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 recently. There's nothing the Nigerian child benefits from the government. Nothing. nothing. Do the government mean us well? After the break, I speak to our Nigerian youth. Please stay with us. Nigerians, who bewitched you? So in October 2020, I still have to explain why I didn't vote for President Jonathan or President Buhari in 2015. Why are the Nigerian youth looking for who to blame for Nigeria's woes in 2020? Anyone except the people in government, actually. Is it cowardice or ignorance? Omoyele Shoure, a presidential candidate in the 2019 elections, called Bonaboy, a Nigerian musician, to really be like Fela, who Bonaboy claims was his biggest inspiration in his music by joining the Revolution Now protest that Omoyele Shore was calling for October 1st, asking for reversals of fuel price and electricity tariffs. Bonaboy replied to Shore saying he didn't trust politicians because it is easy to love and support Fela now that Fela has been dead 23 years. Young people then decided to use the opportunity to call Shore a traitor saying he supported President Buhari against President Jonathan in 2015, only to contest against President Buhari in 2019. I always ask, who has bewitched Nigerians? Is it who I supported in any election that should determine how I hold government accountable? Should asking for good governance become a taboo? Because I supported and voted for Professor Remy Shonaya in 2015, I refuse to support the APC in 2019. I don't get it. Every citizen has a right to vote and be voted for. Why then do we keep on attacking people for supporting whoever they supported that we believe is a failure now in government? Why don't we use the same energy to face the people in government and demand that they do better? Who are the Nigerian youths waiting for next? to be Nigeria's messiah, because that was what they told us in 2015, that President Buhari was going to be Nigeria's messiah. While they focus on their, all their energies on sports betting or reality TV. You know, I've always said it, that if only Nigerian youths could channel that same energy and focus they give to reality TV shows, to politics, hey, we'll have reached the promised land by now. Their excuse is that when you vote, for reality TV um, characters, mm -hmm. you know your that your counts. vote counts. <laughs> no, but really, no, but that's not the, it's in everywhere, it's in everywhere, in most countries of the world, even um, what you do, you create mentorship to encourage youth participation. Right. Mm -hmm. But here we intentionally don't create mentorship. And then um, you also find out that, that you know, you create distractions. Mm. There are youths who are interested in politics, but unfortunately they're not the one who should be interested in politics. Mm. And, and so that's why if you go to local political meeting, you meet some young people there, those you could ordinarily would refer to as a miscreant. They rise up from there to become leaders, to become senators. But those who ordinarily should be interested will not be interested. And then what they do is this uh, mentality of I am better than you. Mm. And so if you supported uh, President Buhari before, you don't have a right to criticize him now. Imagine. After all, we told you then you should have seen it. Mm. So why are you criticizing him now? It's, you know, suffer him. And then you sit down there, fold your hands, you are doing nothing. And we all suffer in silence. Yes. I tell people consistently we are the ones in opposition. Not the APC, not the PDP. Mm. I, I, I said it last week and I'm saying it again. A do election. You expected all the big politicians, including Showare, to go to a do to support their candidates. You know, or even if he couldn't go because of uh, the court um, order against him, let the party, you know, members. Uh, members go and rally around. But we're all debating APC, PDP. And then it, it became so obvious that really what you have are platforms. All other political parties are platforms. True. Where people who are driven from these major parties go to seek, 
you know, fortune or, or political office. It, or it's, political it's, relevance. Yes, it's quite unfortunate. And so they keep intentionally keep the youth out of it because the day they, the youth will realize the uprising will be massive. And that's why even Nance now. True. Their own is been how to get over. money. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Nance has been think, bought over me, and seen it me, on I national think, TV. Yeah. Bought over. I think uh, the youth. Absolutely useless. The youth, even though we talk about uh, this thing all the time, that uh, the youth are preoccupied with, uh, you know, this. Uh, Entertainment. Of, uh, entertainment, entertainment, and entertainment is that. good. But if you go all but, over the world, mm -hmm. you know, people, it is people's prerogative to decide what they want to do. Mm. But for the benefit of doubt, why they enmesh themselves in entertainment and all that, they should also take the same strength and the same energy to the era, arena of politics too. You have to and then dissipate them. Otherwise, they won't just stand up. You know, that, that, that's what I'm saying. But if you look at it now, participation, youth participation in politics is increasing by the day. So we are getting that awareness and we're, we're gradually it's getting to that point. It's not increasing exponentially. I, I, it, it, it increases. I, 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 yeah, so but in growth, it's systematic. Say do. Yes. Um, I have... I say do. Somebody say you're a youth. Uh, <laughs> Somebody is always telling you something about it. There's sense of we have in Nigeria <laughs> that you feel that, you know, leadership should just be placed on your lap. No, you have, you have to struggle for it, Right. Youth, if you want leadership, you have to start working from now. I believe that people like uh, Fela Durotoy made a very good outing. I mean, he should, but he, the approach, the strategy, in my own opinion, was wrong. He should have started from maybe the Senate. Create, go there and, you know, sponsor bills and people will get to know what he's doing and then move. Moving to presidency, considering the dynamics of the country today, it's very, very hard. We have a population that is largely youthful, and yet we cannot put a representative within that age bracket in government. Then there's a problem. There's well, a big right? problem. Too the leadership we have today, the leadership we have, they say, is a reflection of us. A lot of us sit down, we criticize this government. Go to your local government and see the rots there. How many people pay taxes? How many people even support I help disagree. government to do the things they're supposed to. We criticize, but we don't realize that I we are all do. part and parcel. The local government is intentionally made If you want to hold somebody yeah. accountable, yeah. you check we, yourself first. Are you doing the right thing? Are you a model citizen? The, the country in itself. Yeah, we, we should. The yeah. country in itself is a oh. local government. The president is local yes. government chairman. <laughs> the, 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 Again, the president politics, must inspire confidence. Politics is very expensive in Nigeria and poverty is weaponized. So the young people who join political parties, if they're not miscreants, if you're educated, you don't want to waste your life. You know, just carrying somebody's briefcase up and about, which is why they go into entertainment where they know that they yeah, can. It pays true. them. Where there is no violence. One, one hit, you make millions, you know. Why? But it is time to finally draw the curtains on this week's episode of The Advocate. However, The Advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, also hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous podcasts, please go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate NG. Please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this same station, let's keep advocating for a better society. Bye. Zie, zie. Say do. Bye-bye. Zie, Bye, say do. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.